afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me over your lunch break um, to come learn about the Texas High Speed Train Project. Um, as mentioned, my name is Rebecca Cowell. I am the Director of External Affairs for the Texas High Speed Train Project. I have had the great fortune of being with this project for almost seven years now. Um, started back in 2013 and really have been able to see the full project development trajectory from the feasibility stage into the development stage, onward into pre-construction, which is where we are today, and then hopefully soon into construction and then operations soon after. So uh, just show of hands in the room, who in here has ever had the pleasure of driving I-45 south to Houston? <laughs> Keep your hand in the air if you've never experienced a traffic delay, uh, a speed trap, a construction delay, okay, all of the hands are gone. Uh, it's not really a very reliable mode of transportation. There's always a, a contingency of, of, I might be a few minutes late or a couple hours late, depending on traffic, when you are traveling by car. Who in here has ever flown to Houston from this area before? Keep your hand in the air if you've never experienced a delay at a gate, delay at the tarmac, long security line, all the hands are down. Uh, so not really a uh, reliable mode of transportation either. So what Texas Central is looking to do is to provide a reliable, safe, and efficient travel uh, alternative to the modes that are offered to us today that aren't necessarily as reliable and as safe. We are looking to do this by bringing the first true high-speed train to the United States right here in Texas. Uh, looking at bringing the Japanese Shinkansen system uh, that boasts in uh, just this past month, uh, celebrated its 55th year of operation in Japan, moved over 10 billion passengers in that time frame, and has never experienced a loss of life due to malfunction of operation. It is the only mode of transportation in the entire world with a perfect safety record. You compare that to I-45, it is currently ranked as the second deadliest highway in the country. So being able to provide ourselves, our children, our families, our friends with something that is incredibly safe is going to be a game changer for Texas. In that same 55 year time frame, this system boasts an average annual delay of less than one minute. Put your hand in the air if you can average out the delays you've experienced at an airport or on the highway to less than one minute in 55 years. <laughs> laughter. Uh, that does not happen here. Um, so this is a video of the train, the Shinkansen system we will be bringing to Texas. Um, it is an entirely electric train powered by overhead catenary wire, a completely double track system with a dedicated northbound and a dedicated southbound track to where you're never going to have two trains going at each other at 200 miles per hour on the same track. Um, again, that's made possible, a 90 minute journey between North Texas and Houston is made possible by speeds of up to 205 miles per hour. It will be an entirely grade separated system, so it will either be built like this in this video where it is technically elevated on an embankment with a pass through berm spray faced frequently and conveniently throughout, or the majority of the system will be built like this on elevated viaduct structures that allow free and open access underneath the rails. Uh, this beautiful train on the screen you see behind me is the latest generation of this Shenkansen technology. This is the N700 Supreme train uh, that will be debuted in Japan ahead of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Right now it is currently in the safety and commission uh, testing phase in Japan, but again operational hopefully this summer before the Olympics begin. This is the model of train that the Texas system will be based off of. We will be custom building a train fit for the Texas environment, uh, things like a, a more robust HVAC system, for instance, to deal with some of our Texas weather in the summertime. Uh, as compared to pre the previous model of this train, the one you just saw in the video, this actually uses 7% less energy and weighs several tons less than the previous model. Um, this is the result of over 55 years of continuous innovation and improvement on the technology behind this system. What really makes this project unique, however, is the way in which we are approaching the funding for it. This is an entirely investor-owned project with private investors putting their money and capital at risk for the project. You as taxpayers will not pay for this system unless you choose to purchase a ticket to ride on it. We are not accepting government grants for construction. We are not accepting government ongoing operational subsidies once the train is running fully and truly a private effort, which we believe is the right way to make infrastructure development here in Texas. 
Uh, we have conducted several uh, studies to date, both from the feasibility perspective, the economic impact perspective, and the ridership perspective. We have actually conducted uh, one of the most uh, comprehensive and robust travel studies ever conducted on the North Texas to Houston travel corridor. What we found is already today, there is an existing and robust transportation network uh, of people who travel in between those two metro areas. Over 16 million individual journeys are already being made annually. We know from the state demographers' projections that the populations in both North Texas and Houston are also about to double in the next few decades. We currently have about 6 million people in DFW and about 6 million people in Houston. We're about to have 12 million in either of those two metropolitan areas. Collin County in particular just surpassed 1 million residents in the last couple years. Uh, the projections for this area actually have Collin County ranked as the fourth fastest growing uh, area or county in the entire country, right behind Houston. Uh, so this area is experiencing tremendous growth. I'm actually a Plainoite, born and raised, not born and raised, um, but we moved here about 20 years ago uh, to the area back when Parkwood was a dirt road that I'd ride my bike on. Now it's several lanes wide and get you all the way up to the colony. Uh, there was no Willow Bend Mall, there was no Super Target. Uh, and I've been able to see firsthand just how this area has exploded. Uh, and it's a really exciting time to be a Collin County resident because of where we are poised to go in the next 20 years. So we have made tremendous amounts of progress to date on this project. And I'll go few, through just a few of those milestones with you right now. So in 2014, we kicked off the environmental impact study for this project. Uh, the Federal Railroad Administration, it's a, the arm of the Department, U.S. Department of Transportation that oversees passenger rail nationwide, uh, are conducting an in-depth, robust uh, environmental impact study on this system and any of the environmental factors that it will impact, such as human environment, cultural environment, uh, built environment, historical environment, and beyond. Uh, we had our first round of capital raise happen the summer of 2015. We raised $75 million from Texas-based investors. For anyone in here who is an entrepreneur, you know that when you start a project, the hardest dollars to raise are the first ones. The fact that the first dollars raised to this project were almost predominantly from the Texas market, and even further was about 50% oversubscribed from the initial amount we were going out to raise, showed incredible appetite for Texas to have a privately developed infrastructure system such as this. Uh, in 2017, we announced that we had hit a major milestone on land acquisition. Over 30% of the total alignment parcels needed for this project were under some form of option agreement, and over 50% in certain counties. Uh, December 2017, the draft environmental impact statement was released by the Federal Railroad Administration. That included the final preferred build alternative, the, the final line on the map. It also included where our, pass, our three passenger stations are going to be located in North Texas, the Brazos Valley, and Houston. Uh, Later on, uh, a few months later, we announced a joint ticketing agreement with Amtrak to where if you are a traveler in Chicago wanting to get all the way south to Houston, with one, per one ticket purchase, one push of a button, you could ride an Amtrak line to, from Chicago to Dallas, transfer to the Texas Central train, and get to Houston without ever having to drive your car. Uh, we announced just a few weeks after that that we had brought on board Bechtel to be our program manager for the project to manage all of the different aspects of the built environment for the system and the infrastructural development. We, 2019, we announced that Citigroup and MUFG had come on board as financial advisors for the project to help us with the capital raise. Uh, and then later on that year, the FRA announced, actually this year, um, the FRA just announced last month that they are moving forward with their rulemaking for the system. Currently in the United States, there are no trains that are capable of going 205 miles per hour. Therefore, there are no rules on how to regulate a train that goes 205 miles per hour. So they are uh, writing a custom set of rules specifically for this technology operating in this particular environment uh, between North Texas and Houston that will be a custom set of rules fit for this system to make them applicable from an uh, operational oversight perspective. 
We also just announced last month that we had finalized our design build contract with Salini and Pregilo along with their US based subsidiary lane construction. They are one of the largest, if not the largest, construction firm in the entire world. They have plenty of experience in delivering mega infrastructure projects such as this uh, globally. And also this month, we have announced the, the uh, creation of our business and uh, business opportunities and workforce programs. Uh, Texas Central is entirely committed to having a diverse and inclusive workforce that provides opportunities for small women, veteran, rural, disability, uh, and any other type of small or disadvantaged business to be able to have an opportunity to participate on this project. So what's next? In 2020, uh, we expect to hopefully have the final approvals from the Federal Railroad Administration, both that environmental piece and the regulatory uh, operational and safety piece. We are targeting construction to begin shortly thereafter. Once we have the two permits in place, we will reach financial close and start putting shovels in dirt. Uh, we are hopeful that that process can begin as early as next year, 2020. We anticipate a roughly between uh, five and six year construction build out timeframe. That'll include a portion of safety and commission testing on the system. And then hopefully by 2026, we will be selling tickets to, to you as the general public to get on board our train and ride to Houston. So here just a smattering of some of the world-class companies working on this project. Again, every single one of these companies have experience in helping to deliver in some form or fashion a mega infrastructure project like this. And, to, and help put in perspective which of these companies are responsible for which aspects of the project. As I mentioned, Salini, along with Lane, are responsible for the civil infrastructure works. So that's everything from the ground to the top of the rails. On top of the rails, we are using Japanese Shinkansen system uh, that has been, again, operational in Japan for 55 years with a flawless safety record and an impeccable on-time performance record, bringing the best of the best in rolling stock uh, choice to Texas as the first high-speed train in America. We also announced about this time last year that we had brought on board Renfe as our strategic operations partner. Uh, they are the second largest train operator worldwide, second only to China. They operate trains on over 7,500 miles of track, mostly in uh, Western Europe. And then Bechtel, as mentioned, is our program manager. So they are the conductors of the orchestra, making sure all of the pieces of the puzzle happen in the right order, at the right time, and fingers crossed, under budget. And of course, City and uh, MUFG on board as well as financial advisors helping us to bring, bring all the pieces of the puzzle together prior to financial close. But this is a huge project. And when I say huge, I mean Texas-sized huge. Literally the largest infrastructure project ever attempted in the state of Texas's history. We know this is going to be a $14 billion, uh, give or take, investment on just the civil infrastructure cost alone. Where does that number come from? 240 miles of double track between Dallas and Houston, along with the additional rail for, for the, the guideways and the staging at the stations. We're also going to use several uh, thousand rail cars filled with track, ballast, and aggregate for the system. Literally three times the amount of concrete that was used to build the Hoover Dam. Incredibly large project. We will also be creating a lot of jobs in order to support the construction of this project. During the construction time frame, once we hit peak construction, we anticipate about 10,000 people will be working on this system. Uh, again, between uh, five and six years for the build out of this system. Then once up and operational, there will be more than 1,500 direct, permanent, full-time jobs created by this project. And those are just direct jobs. In ancillary and supporting services, it is estimated that for every one job we create permanently, it will spur an additional two to four jobs in adjacent industries. So literally planting the seed of a brand new high-tech domestic industry right here in Texas. And once the system's up and operational, and other cities throughout the United States look at what we've accomplished and look at how successful it is, they're going to come here to learn about it. We are going to be the experts. We are going to be the ones with the trained workforce. We are going to have the wherewithal to share our knowledge with other states in America and really be the leaders in this innovative transportation for the United States. 
As mentioned, we uh, have been working on acquiring the right-of-way for this project. This line on the map behind me is the final route that was given to us by the Federal Railroad Administration as part of their draft environmental impact study. Uh, we internally lovingly call this alignment the utility corridor because it predominantly follows adjacent to existing inf uh, utility and infrastructure right-of-way corridors that already exist. Further, uh, again, the majority of the system will be elevated to provide free access underneath the tracks, and it provides a better space-saving solution when you talk about land use. Uh, for every one mile of interstate highway development, it converts about 430 uh, acres of farmland to non-farmland use. For every one mile of high-speed train development, you're only converting about approximately 33 miles, or 33 acres, excuse me. So that's a, a difference of over 400 acres being preserved for every mile of high-speed train that is built instead of, high, or instead of highway. So incredibly efficient as far as a land use perspective goes. Literally the best way to move the maximum number of people using the minimum amount of space. Also one of the biggest responsibilities on Texas Central shoulders is to be good stewards of Texas land. It is an issue we take incredibly seriously and we want to set the gold standard in how private companies who are developing linear infrastructure work with landowners. Uh, we are committed to having sit-down discussions with each individual impacted landowner to discuss what their individual needs uh, might be for this project. Everyone's impact is different, everyone's land use is different, and so we want to make sure that the offers being made to landowners are reflective of their individual situations and work with them to come to a win-win solution. As mentioned, this train is entirely electric. Therefore, it will be good for the Texas environment. Uh, we know from that draft environmental impact statement that was released that the FRA estimates that once this system is up and operational, it will remove over 14,630 cars off of I-45 every single day. That's going to lead to net, net reductions in nitrous oxides, volatile organic compounds, and greenhouse gas emissions in the air that we all breathe. That also leads to an approximate annual savings of about 81.5 million gallons of gasoline. That is the equivalent of removing or preventing 700,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide to be spewed into the air that we breathe. Uh, air is a shared resource and one that we want to take care of as we move forward with this process and it, we are very excited to bring a transportation system to Texas that is incredibly efficient. Uh, this system also has lots of technologies built into the rolling stock, built into the train that go further as far as environmental savings. Uh, this, the, these trains have regenerative braking technologies to where when the brakes are applied to this train, it recaptures some of that kinetic energy and puts it back up into the overhead catenary wire system to be able to reutilize that for starting up again once uh, we're ready to take off. And the benefits economically from this project will be felt throughout the entire state of Texas. We know that based off of our initial investment in this project, in this infrastructure, it will spur a direct cumulative economic impact of about 36 billion dollars for the state of Texas over the next 25 years. That is the economic equivalent of having 84 Super Bowls happen in 25 years here in Texas. Who here would like 84 Super Bowls to happen in Texas in the next 25 years? Um, even further than that, of all of the jobs being created for this project, both in the construction time frame and in the operational time frame, 25% of those will be based in rural communities. One of the hardest challenges that rural communities face is attracting business interests that will establish an ongoing permanent source of tax revenue and provide jobs for their communities so where someone can have a good paying, high wage, highly skilled and highly technical job in the same community that they send their kids to school or they go to church. It's an exciting opportunity for, for rural Texas to have something like this that will be paying taxes as a privately held and owned piece of infrastructure rather than taking them as would a publicly developed highway project. So there will be three stations that are built as part of this system, one in North Texas, one in the Brazos Valley, and one in Houston. Uh, who, I'll start with the Brazos Valley. Who in here is a Texas A&M Aggie or a Sam Houston Bearcat? Whoop. Or maybe your paychecks go there. <laughs> a 
few more of you. Um, so for those of you who have friends or family who go to one of those institutions, or maybe you're an alum of one of those institutions and like to go back for football games and conferences, there will be a midpoint station in that Brazos Valley area. It, from the Dallas station, which is, will serve all of North Texas, it would be about an hour ride to get you to that area. Uh, in Dallas, the station will be located just south of downtown, walking distance to the K. Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center in the neighborhood known as the Cedars. If any of you are familiar with that uh, big red brick building just south of downtown, the South Side on the Mar building, that's where our Dallas office is located, and there's a big lot of land right behind it. Uh, that is where the Dallas station will be. In the Brazos Valley, that station that will service Texas A&M, Blinn, Sam Houston State, will be located in Grimes County in a community known as Roans Prairie. And then traveling south to Houston, that station will be located in the northwest area of Houston, uh, taking over what is currently today uh, the Northwest Mall. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Houston, the Northwest Mall is their equivalent of Valley View. Um, it's an old abandoned mall that has been uh, left forgotten as far as economic development goes, and we're very excited to come into that area and economically revitalize it through building a mixed-use development train station and attracting all of the private development that you would expect uh, around a transit-oriented type development situation. So has anyone in this room ever ridden on a high-speed train in another country before? Good amount of you. Uh, anybody in Japan? A few of you. Okay, I am going to pick on you. Um, it, it, would you mind standing up and sharing with the room what your experience was like riding on the train in Japan? Uh, yes, in 1970. Uh, wait one minute. Wait one minute. Sorry. <laughs> uh, in 1970, my husband and I were in Japan. His process of factory was being honored as part of some of their celebration. And it was very exciting. It was really wonderful and very, very smooth, surprisingly smooth. We went from Tokyo to Kyoto, and it was fascinating. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. So uh, she mentioned the smoothness of the ride. So you can all get on YouTube and fact check me when I'm done speaking. But if you uh, search Shinkan Challenge, you will literally find dozens of videos of people balancing a coin on its edge on the windowsill of the train while the train is going full speed and the coin will not fall over. I don't think I could manage that on this podium. Um, so very impressive as far as the smoothness of the ride. I always joke with you, if you ever get onto a high speed train that has seat belts, you need to get the hell off of that train. Um, <laughs> that's not a good sign. It is a, indeed a very smooth ride. Um, one of the benefits of the, the Texas system, so again, we're utilizing the N700 Supreme uh, Shinkansen system, bringing it to Texas to be custom built, modified for the operational environment here. Uh, in Japan, they run a three by three seating consist in their regular uh, class of service. Texas, everything's a little bit bigger, so we are removing the middle seat. We're gonna size seats for Texas sized shoulders. Extra wide bodied seats with lots of leg room, about the same experience you'd have uh, in the first class section of an airline, but in every single seat on this train. Uh, more importantly, when you remove that middle seat, uh, so these trains are the widest passenger trains worldwide, about 11 feet wide. When you remove that middle seat and have a two by two seating consist, first, you won't have to play the armrest shuffle with your neighbor. You'll get to have two that are your very own. Um, but it leaves an aisle width wide enough for a full-size wheelchair or power chair to be comfortably rolled onto the train, down aisles, in between train cars, in and out of accessible restrooms, and off of the train again without somebody having to give up their personal vehicle of mobility. For the disability community, that is huge. Uh, once operational, this will be one of the most accessible modes of transportation in the entire country, and we're very excited about that aspect of the project. Um, so I've got just a very, very short two-minute video to show for you guys that explains a little bit more about what the customer experience is going to be like riding on this train, and then I will close up and open up the floor for questions. Time has become a commodity, actually one of our most precious resources. We want to fill it like this, or this, but for too many Texans, it's filled like this. That's why we're working on this. For commuters between North Texas and Houston, it's the Texas High Speed Train, the fastest and safest way across Texas. Trimming a four and a half hour slog into a smooth 90 minutes. Say you're in Houston, 
just after daycare drop-off. You get an urgent request. Can you be in Dallas for a rush meeting at noon? By air? No. By car? Absolutely not. By the high-speed train? Yes. Trains leave every 30 minutes between North Texas and Houston, in both directions. And with just that, you're on. Your itinerary stays a step ahead, building itself on the fly. Say you had a car in Dallas. Done. And the station's right where you want them. We'll help you find your way, in person or with cues to guide your way. Trains leave on time, every time. But if you choose, you can hang out a bit. You're still on track for that noon meeting. Security also works differently, using technology to ensure just the right people are on board. Again, trains leave every 30 minutes, literally like clockwork. No delays, no weather glitches, no airport nightmares. Choose to order any food. It'll be delivered right to your seat. Charge your devices right from your tabletop. And at nearly 200 miles an hour, stop and go becomes all go. 90 minutes between North Texas and Houston, there's fast connectivity to whatever you want. Movies, TV, even updates on your itinerary. And as you order stuff on board, we'll tally up and send receipts to your device. As you get closer, your device is tracking, lining up your ride and other info for your arrival. Then, you're there. A morning fire drill turned into a noon meeting. And the return, just as easy amazingly getting you back well ahead of pickup. 90 minutes across Texas. It's the smarter, safer, and faster way across Texas. So we are really excited, again, to be bringing a first of its kind transportation solution to Texas. Uh, these are just a few of the organizations, either locally, regionally, statewide, or nationally, who are also excited about having this project here in Texas. We would love to add the Collin County Association of Realtors to this list. Um, but with that, we are on social media. If you are also on social media, we would love to talk to you and have a conversation. Um, if you get out your phone and text the word TRAIN to 52886, it'll put you on our update list. I run that program. I promise I'm not going to text you every day. It's only for the big stuff. Uh, but with that, I'll open it up for questions should you have them. Thank you. I think Bojo's coming around with the mic. Hi. <laughs> That's very impressive. Uh, you mentioned that you have acquired about 30% of the land under option contract as of now. You're talking about next year construction starts. What about the 70% of the land? Sure. So 30% for the full total alignment and over 50% in several of the counties that are more on the southern end of the alignment It was because until December of 2017 when that draft environmental impact statement was released, if you looked at the alignment map and all the different options that were still under evaluation from an environmental perspective, we knew uh, the southern half of the alignment a little bit before that, but it was really that northern end of the alignment that looked like colorful spaghetti where there are a few different options. So we really weren't able to focus our real estate efforts on the northern portion up until uh, recently. So we are, we are working to, to refocus our efforts on that northern end, but knowing that in the southern end, it's, it's in most counties over 50%. Uh, what is the capacity and um, what do you think the price would be? So we anticipate the capacity per train set at about approximately 400 passengers per train set. In Japan, they run a 16 train car consist. In Texas, we will be running an eight train car consist. Um, so a little bit shorter of a train um, with, again, removing that middle seat to provide additional space for our passengers. Uh, as far as ticket prices go, we're going to have a dynamic pricing model, just how airlines do, just like how hotel companies do, to where if you are purchasing in advance and you're wanting to ride on an off-peak day at an off-peak time, your ticket price is going to be much less than someone showing up Monday at 8 a.m. saying, I need a first-class ticket on the next train departing. Um, we know on the high end, tickets will be comparable or competitive with airfare, but on the low end, they're going to be competitive with what it costs to drive your car. And those are two very different numbers, uh, and we're going to hit every single price point within that range just based on you guys as the traveling public. Okay. 
what is the noise like for, from the train? From the train. Great question. So I'll I'll start with the interior and then go to the exterior. So the interior of the train, when you're a passenger riding on it, incredibly quiet. You do not hear or feel like you're moving at all. Um, it's it's. It's one of those sensations that's very hard to describe to someone who's never experienced riding on one of these trains. Um, but it's, it, it's, it sounds about how it does in this room when you're riding on the train inside of it. Now on the outside of the train, it's, it does make some noise, um, but it is much le uh, quieter than a freight train or a highway. Uh, and the sound patterns are much less frequent. If you're standing about 50 yards in distance from the train looking straight forward, it's in your line of sight for about three seconds and in your sound profile for about five seconds. And the sound profile that comes to these trains is not a low rumble like you, or with, a, with a lot of vibrations like you consider with a freight train. It's more of a, high, a higher pitched whoosh sound. Um, so again, incredibly quiet. And these, these trains were built and engineered to operate some of the most dense urban environments in the world. Downtown Tokyo is one of the most dense environments in the world and people still uh, choose to buy luxury high-end apartments and condos right on top of or next to train stations because of the fact that it's very quiet. Dr. Nelson? <laughs> How many stations and stops will there be from Dallas to Houston? My other question is you just mentioned different classes. There's going to be a first class on the train. So there will be three passenger stations, one in, North, in Dallas serving North Texas, one in the Brazos Valley serving the Brazos Valley area communities, and one in Northwest Houston serving the greater Houston region. So in that 90 minutes, they're going to stop at each of those? Yes, in that 90 minute figure does include stopping in that midpoint station in the Brazos Valley. And there will be uh, some trains that don't stop, that'll be express trains, and they'll get you there even faster. Um, as far as classes of service goes, we know that we will have different classes of service, a first class equivalent, a business class or, or standard class equivalent. However, we're doing the background research right now, um, looking at what the different levels of service we're going to have will be, what kind of amenities and price structures or uh, perks will be associated with each different level. And those are the, the more consumer facing questions that we're working through right now back at our offices. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just wondering on the security aspect when it scans the faces, what databases are you guys going to be checking that against and you said to make sure the right people get on. I'm just, I want to know a little bit more about that. Great question. So our security and emergency preparedness plans are going to uh, be, we're working with Department of Homeland Security, FBI, and DHS to, to help uh, provide in, input to those plans. And before our final emergency and security plans are in place, they will have approval by, by those security agencies that exist today. Um, in the video, we use facial recognition as the, the example of some of the security technologies that you might see at one of these stations. It is not saying that we will definitely have that. Um, but one of the benefits of building a high-speed train station, you know, tw starting either in 2020, 2021, is we're able to build it from the ground up with security technologies integrated into the infrastructure. Unlike an airport that was maybe built in the 60s and 70s that have had to retrofit in uh, post 9-11 style security into environments that weren't designed to have that kind of security, we're going to get to take advantage of the latest and greatest in security technological advances and build them into the infrastructure of the stations. So, you know, by 2026, when we're operating trains, facial recognition might not be the latest and greatest technology, and so we're leaving the door open to, to work with the agencies that exist to make sure that we're taking advantage of technology and working with those agencies to make sure that we're doing it in a responsible way. And I, I, even further than that, you know, on the security and technology front, um, many people don't realize it, but along the tracks, there are sensors that are installed as part of the infrastructure. And these sensors serve a couple of different roles. First, they, they gather data for us on, in a real-time method to where you know, these sensors know, and they're smart, they know exactly at what millisecond the train should be passing, going what speed, and if any of that is off, it can recalibrate the system. And even further than that, if you know, there's a sensor that's near an energy substation that's normally putting off about 95% power, and then all of a sudden the data starts saying it's giving off 94% and 93%, we can send a technician out to fix whatever the problem is before the problem occurs, uh, which helps the operations go extremely smoothly and uh, contributes to that on-time performance record uh, metric I mentioned earlier. But these sensors 
are additionally so sensitive, back in 2011 when the Fukushima earthquake hit in Japan, these sensors actually picked up the preliminary waves of the earthquake before it happened. And these trains were able to be stopped by the time the earthquake hit, not a single life was lost on these trains that day. Wow. So incredible amounts of security technologies built into the actual trains and tracks and stations themselves. Do you have the, uh, do you have mechanisms in place to acquire any of this land by eminent domain if you can't, if the landowners don't want to throw me up? So it is our strong preference to purchase land on a voluntary basis and work with landowners directly. Um, we'd much rather have our future neighbors uh, have a little bit of extra money in their pocket than uh, lawyers. However, there are statutes that were written into the Texas State Constitution back in, in the 1800s that established a long precedence of privately operated railroads in the state of Texas, along with a few other private industries such as pipelines or uh, telecom that need linear rights of way uh, to make use of the right of eminent domain because they're classified as common carriers. Um, so our, again, strong preference to continue uh, negotiations, how they've been going on a voluntary basis, but it is a tool in the toolbox that uh, exists for this project should we have to make use of it. Um, here, so question, you may have already mentioned it. So trains are leaving every 30 minutes. Um, three, tra three trains for walls. Three compartments connected, correct? Three compartments. Yeah, uh, three connected train stations. So Up this stations. Part, okay, well, not, not stations. Just oh, so it's just what? Yeah, so it's one car. Oh, one so six. there are eight train cars per train set. So how many? How many trains are we talking about? So okay, some so of you might need to get out a napkin and do math, but we plan on running trains during rush hour equivalents in the mornings and afternoons every 30 minutes during those periods every hour off rush hour period with six hours reserved every night for track maintenance up Kate, i think that comes out to about 68 trains per day um, that are departing the stations but again please check my math because i am not an engineer you <laughs> said the system was uh, privately owned and operated or funded at least uh, what percentage of that uh, is Texas investment, what percentage of that is U.S. investment versus foreign So with any large scale infrastructure project, you know, they, it does get opened up to global markets. Right now there is over $200 billion in dry powder looking for a home in a privately developed infrastructure investment with preference for the North American and European markets. There is definitely the money out there to make it happen. Where that money gets sourced from will be a, a handled by our financial team and our financial advisors with Citigroup and MUFG. Um, but we don't we don't necessarily give up percentages of with what's coming there, mostly because I don't know. Yes, are there any uh, future stops after Houston, maybe Austin, anywhere? So we have our hands full developing the first high-speed train in the country. Uh, so we are squarely focused on this Dallas to Houston route. Um, you know, all of the environmental impact statements that are, that are being done for this project are focused on the environmental impacts of that route. The rule of particular applicability, you know, the safety and technology rule for this project are based in that geographic location. So we are, we are all eyes on getting this first one up and running and we will potentially look at future opportunities when, when the market demands it and when it makes financial sense. But because we are a private company, every decision that we make is based on data. And so we actually looked at about 90 plus city pairs um, early on in this project's development to see where it made feasible sense to make a privately developed high-speed train work in America. And across the board, when you compared all of the metrics, you know, population growth projections, uh, per capita GDP, how this, how's the housing market doing, what is the economic linkage of the two areas, are there giant mountains or huge uh, valleys in between geographically, and what we found is that the DFW to Houston route made the most sense to make a privately financed high-speed train work anywhere in America. So we are squarely focused on this corridor. Uh, will this train be running every day, seven days a week, 365? That is the goal with, again, the six hours reserved each night for track maintenance and upkeep. Do you expect any uh, carbon offsets to participate in the economic viability of the project? Great question. So we actually announced, um, I think it was the beginning of this year, 
Um, but RES Partners, uh, they are an ecological uh, preservation company, offset company based out of Houston, and one of the largest in the U.S. that does what they do. And they are providing us with a comprehensive mitigation plan for construction and ongoing operations to make sure that we are doing the proper offsets for, for the disturbance that will happen from the construction time frame to offset that initially. But going forward, um, you know, as ridership increases and as the frequency of service increases throughout time, it makes the system more and more and more energy efficient. Even further than that, the good news is that the Texas grid is getting more green. Uh, we actually lead the country in wind and solar power, um, and as the Texas grid gets greener, so will this train. We have time for just two more questions. So the gentleman back here. You guys gonna have like a TSA checkpoint like they do at the airports? So yes, TSA is involved with, uh, again, our security and emergency preparedness plans. But when people hear TSA, they think airport TSA, and that's not what you will experience. It'll be a far more passive uh, procedure. You won't have to take off your belt or your shoes unless you know you want to. Um, <laughs> but uh, again, making use of those latest and greatest technologies for security. And the last question is here. The technology behind it is Megla, right? No, so this is traditional steel rail on steel wheel, Shinkansen high-speed train technology. And so we, we looked early on at potentially bringing the magnetic levitation system to Texas. Um, but because we are doing this from a private perspective and we vowed not to take an ongoing operational subsidy, when you look at the cost comparison, you know, the Shinkansen system is X, maglev system is 10X, and just didn't make financial feasibility sense uh, for the private development route that we are going. However, even with the Shinkansen technology we are bringing to, the, to Texas, it will still be the fastest train in the entire country once operational. So down, in, down the road, do you expect a speed could increase with new technology coming up? Certainly. Um, you know, as new technologies and you know, further generations of the Shinkansen train get implemented and, and innovated, uh, we absolutely have the opportunity to, to upgrade our trains as, as you know, technology availability increases and we get further down the development line and the operational line. So that means it could be 60 minutes instead of 90 minutes, right? <laughs> I, we can't speculate because I have no idea what the next generation of Shinkansen is going to look like or the speeds it will be capable of, but at, at this moment in time we do know we could upgrade the system you know, at, at the time that it makes sense. Okay, thanks. All right, Rebecca, thank you so much for this presentation.